guys, welcome to Sunday. In case you don't know me, my name's Dale and I'm part of the team that leads New Life Community Church here in Fordingbridge. Today we're continuing our preaching series called If God, So What? And the topic of my message is, what about other religions? In other words, if for argument's sake we agree that God does exist, what do we make of the fact that there are so many other religions in the world? Now, obviously, this is a massive topic and I don't have time to cover every possible answer or position, but I think it will serve us well if we looked at three key points. First of all, I want to look at conventional wisdom. If we agree that God exists, how does our society and culture advise that we should answer this question? Then I want to look at how that explanation relates to the other religions. Does it work? Does it fit? And then finally, I want to look at what the Bible has to say. How the Bible says we should answer the question of other religions. So what does conventional wisdom say? Well, we're fortunate to live in a country that values freedom of choice, inclusiveness, equality and tolerance. So one of the most common answers to this question is that it doesn't matter which God you worship or how you practice that worship, because in the end, all religions lead to God. Now, that's based on the assumption that if there is a God, then all religions are basically the same with only minor differences. Each religion is just grasping around trying to understand something different about God. The idea is illustrated really well by an old story about some blind men and an elephant. Now, it's got lots of versions, but it basically goes like this. A group of blind men heard of a strange animal called an elephant, but obviously they'd never seen one. They wanted to know what it was like, so they asked someone to lead them to it. When they arrived at the creature, they began to feel about to try and get an understanding of what it was like. The first man grabbed hold of the elephant's trunk and decided that the elephant was exactly like a powerful snake. The next man put his arms around the elephant's leg and thought, an elephant has a thick base or pillar, so it must be just like the trunk of a big tree. On feeling the tail, the third man exclaimed, an elephant is like a strong rope. And as the fourth man felt the ear, he concluded that an elephant was like a huge fan. The point of the story is pretty simple. The elephant represents God. And because all humans are to some extent blind to the spiritual things of God, we're left to explore what God is like through our individual experiences. No one person has the whole picture. But when each person's experience is shared and considered together, a much clearer picture of God emerges. In practice, what this means is that no one religion has the ultimate idea of God. No one can say, my ideas about God are better than your ideas about God. It means all religions are just different people's subjective experiences of God. And it encourages us to share those experiences with each other so we can learn from one another and grow in our understanding of God. Sounds right, doesn't it? It's inclusive. Everyone's equal. It encourages tolerance and it gives us the freedom to choose. If all religions are basically the same, with only minor differences, then in reality, religion is like a mixed buffet. If we don't agree or like something about Christianity, we can swap it for a bit of Hinduism, or we can add a little bit of spiritualism or paganism on the side. As long as we enjoy what's on our plate, we can mix and match as we see fit. But does it work? Does it fit? I really don't think it does. And here's a few reasons why. If I go to a mixed buffet and I choose to put chicken chow mein on my pepperoni pizza or dunk calamari and curry sauce, I can. That's fine. Disgusting, but fine. As long as it tastes good to me, I'm free to do that 
because there's no consequences. I can be subjective about the taste of the foods I mix together. It might not be to someone else's liking, but they're free to choose something else. However, if I take my diesel car to get fuel and I mix in 30 quids worth of petrol at the, um, petrol at the same time, I won't make it 100 yards before my engine breaks down and I do potentially irreparable damage to the fuel system. In that context, I can choose to mix and match my fuel, but there are serious consequences if I do. The problem is, religion is more like refueling my car than eating at a buffet. The truth is that all religions make exclusive claims. Christianity says that Jesus is God and that he lived, died on a cross and rose again on the third day so that those who believe in him alone can have eternal life. Islam disagrees because it asserts that Allah alone is God, that Jesus didn't die on the cross, so had no need to rise again, and entry to paradise comes from following the will of Allah. Buddhism contradicts both those claims because it doesn't recognize one ultimate God at all, but sees the universe as an eternal cycle of life, death, and rebirth. Doing good deeds allows you to be reincarnated as a higher being each life until you reach nirvana. Logically, these statements can't all be true. Either Allah is God or Jesus is. Either you can enter paradise by following Allah or you strive for nirvana each life. As the apologist Andy Bannister says, it's not that most religions are fundamentally the same with superficial differences, but the reverse is the case. Most religions have superficial similarities with fundamental differences. And it's those fundamental differences that shape our worldview because they say things about our origins, our worth, our personhood, and ultimately, they speak about the ultimate consequences of our choices. But what about the elephant story? Doesn't that prove all religions lead to God? Well, no. It's quite the opposite, in fact. You see, the whole premise of that argument is that we're all blindly feeling around for God, and no one person has the whole picture. No one can see the objective truth. The only way to learn about the elephant or God is to experience it blindly. Except that's not true of the story, is it? The story itself is told from the perspective of a person who does have the whole picture. They can see that the elephant is an elephant. It's a fact. They can also see that the blind men are wrong. The elephant is not a snake, a fan, a rope, a tree trunk. It's an elephant. It's as if someone's saying, no one can know the objective truth or the facts about God except me, because I see the big picture and I know the objective truth about God. Not only is that argument self-defeating, it also elevates that perspective above all the others claiming that it is the only right perspective. Now, that's a truth claim on par with any other religion. Not very inclusive now, is it? Another problem with this story is that it doesn't take into account the possibility that the elephant could talk. If the elephant could talk, it could say, I'm afraid you chaps are quite mistaken. That's not a snake. It's my nose. And the thing you thought was a tree trunk? actually my leg, and you are talking rather loudly into my ear, and you, sir, are pulling my tail in a rather undignified manner. Of course, God is not an elephant. But what if God could speak for himself and tell us what he's like? As Christians, we believe he can and has done. We call that revelation. The book of Hebrews says, long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now, in these final days, he has spoken to us 
through his son. This is absolutely vital to understand. God hasn't left us to stumble and fumble around like men in the dark, trying to work out who he is. He's spoken directly to us in many ways. Whether through the cosmos he brought into being that has his fingerprints all over it, or through the humans he created to reflect his image, right through the prophetic messengers he sent to partner with him in writing his words to us in the Bible, and into his greatest revelation, his son Jesus, who expresses the fullness of the very character and nature of God. That leads me to my final point. What does the Bible say about other religions? Now, the Bible doesn't pull any punches here, so neither will I. But I want you to remember, this is not my subjective opinion. This is what God himself has said in his word to us, the Bible. In Exodus 20, uh, verse 2 to 4, we get the Ten Commandments. And in commandment numero uno, God says, you must not have any other gods but me. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. The God of the Bible acknowledges that there are other religions and that they worship other gods usually through the use of idols or images. And he clearly states that he will not accept any deviation from his command to worship him alone. In 1 Corinthians 10, 19, the Apostle Paul is addressing the issue of Christians accepting food offered to idols or the gods of other religions. And he says this. What am I trying to say? Am I saying that food offered to idols has some significance or that idols are real gods? No, not at all. I am saying that these sacrifices are offered to demons, not to God. And I don't want you to participate with demons. So the gods of other religions are not just incompatible with Christianity. They are real created spiritual beings that have set themselves up in opposition to God. In particular, they love to receive the worship and service of humans in the place of the one true God and to lead them away from him. The Bible calls these being demons and commands Christians to have nothing to do with them. Now, you may be thinking, wow, that is so arrogant. How can you say that the God of the Bible is the only God? and that other religions are against God. That's not inclusive. It doesn't show equality. And what about tolerance and the freedom to choose? Those are great questions. Let's start with equality. You see, the Bible teaches that all human beings are equally made in the image of God. And it's for this reason alone that each human life is equally and incalculably valuable. It's because God's placed value and therefore dig dignity in each of us that we should look to, to our fellow man and see equal value and act accordingly. And while the Bible teaches, no, commands us to see one another as equal, it doesn't see all ideas as equal. Think about it. If there is a God and he has revealed himself through the Bible and ultimately through Jesus Christ, then that truth is infinitely more valuable than any other religious idea, given the consequences. And that basis of, of course, Christianity is not inclusive then. Because if its claims to truth, or because of its claims to truth, it's naturally exclusive. The Apostle Paul, speaking about Jesus in the book of Acts, said, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. But it's exclusive of misleading ideas and untruths, not of people. 
Paul writes in 1 Timothy 2 verse 4 that God desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Now you might still say that that's so intolerant. And you're absolutely right. Because the Bible doesn't deal in tolerance. It deals in love. God does not call us to tolerate other people. He calls us to love them. Matthew 22 verse 39 says, Love your neighbor as yourself. John 13 34 says, Love one another as I have loved you. I'm not called to tolerate others. I'm called to love them, which is much harder. Because when you love someone, you have to point out damaging or destructive behaviours to them. You have to say, hey, don't go down that road. It's not good for you. Take this path instead. But what about your freedom to choose? That is a God-given freedom. And no one can take that away from you. You are free to choose God or to reject him. But just like any other decision we make, there are consequences. If you choose God, eternal life in relationship with him. If you choose to reject him, eternity in hell without him. I told you I wasn't going to pull any punches, and this is as real as it gets. I'm not called to tolerate you. I'm called to love you. And that means pointing out the truth. You may say to me, well, if all religions don't lead to God, how do you know that Christianity is the one that does? The answer to that is simple, because of Jesus. The thing that sets Christianity apart from all other religions is God's grace. Or, in other words, the undeserved favour that he showed us through Jesus. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. To sin is to miss the mark, fail the test, to not reach the standard. You see, not only are we all created equal, we've all equally missed the mark and failed to reach God's standard in our lives. We've all chosen to reject God and go our own way. We've all worshipped something other than God, whether it's the God of another religion, sex, money, power, or ultimately just ourselves. Other religions tend to teach that on our journey through life, we need to work really, really hard to make up for those bad things we do. So that when we die, our good deeds outweigh our bad, earning us the benefit that we want in the next life. But the Bible teaches something very different. Isaiah 64 verse 3 says, We are all infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. Well, the Bible says even when we try to do good works or righteous deeds, they're all infected by our sin and therefore not good enough. The truth is no matter how hard we try, we can never do enough good to outweigh our bad because even our best good is tainted. We need God to act in order for there to be a hope of salvation from our sin. That's the bad news. The good news of Christianity is that he already has. God sent Jesus, who willingly died in your place and took the punishment for your sin on the cross. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And speaking of God's saving activity through Jesus, Colossians 1 verses 13 to 14 says, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Friends, this is the best news. Because of Jesus, we have been redeemed. That is, the debt that our sin has incurred has been paid in full. So we can enjoy God's forgiveness right here and now in this life. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. 
We don't need to wait and see if our good deeds will outweigh our bad deeds when we die. We know they won't. But Jesus promises that if we put our trust in him, we will have eternal life. In conclusion, we've looked at conventional wisdom about other religions. We've seen how a mix and match worldview really doesn't work. And we've seen what the Bible has to say. I'll finish with this thought. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Christianity is not a set of rules or religious practices. Christianity is about a person. It's all about Jesus. And if what he says is true, shouldn't you get to know him? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have created us all equal. I pray for those listening to this message that you would give them the wisdom to understand that not all ideas are equal. God, I pray your revelation in their hearts so they might be able to see the truth in your claims. And I pray that they would seek after you and try to get to know you. God, I pray for my brothers and sisters that we would not be content to be tolerant, to tolerate other people, but that we would seek to love them, even if that means pointing things out in love. Thank you that you, Jesus, came and died on the cross on my, in my place and for my sin. Thank you that that has made me right with God, and I am secure knowing that I have eternal life, not based on what I do or don't do, but based on your love. Amen. Thanks for hanging out, guys. See you again soon.